Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick, a broadcast and online journalist with the Associated Press, and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. It's good to have you here today. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while working to foster a free press worldwide. For more information about the club, you can visit our website at www.press.org and to donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, you can check the website there as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, as well as those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of the speaker, as well as working journalists who are all club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, and this is something I'm reminding people throughout this political season, as well as for today's event, if you hear applause in the audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. <laughs> Laughter is encouraged. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available for free download on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag PoundNPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Well, now it is time to introduce our head table guests. And please note, again in this political season, a journalist's presence at the head table does not imply or signify an endorsement of the speaker. I'd ask each of you to stand up briefly as your name is announced. We begin from your right, Matt Small. He's a veteran radio producer at my shop, the Associated Press. He's so competent, we call him the beast. Also joining us today, Ralph Winnie Jr., a club member, vice president of the Global Business Development for the Eurasian uh, Business Coalition. Good to have you here today, Ralph. Drew Von Bergen, he is among several former NPC presidents gracing our head table today. And it just so happens he is the retired public relations director with the National Association of Letter Carriers. So that's how he got his ticket. Also joining us today is John Cosgrove. He is our senior surviving NPC president organizer of the first Postal Forum, and for those of you who aren't club members and don't know John's story, he was inaugurated 51 years ago this next January. So John was inaugurated when JFK came over and offered him congratulations that day. I'm very happy that John could join us today as well. Uh, Ron Stroman is the Deputy Postmaster General. Thank you for being here, Ron. Skip over the podium for just a moment. Angela Greiling Keene is a reporter for Bloomberg News, and she is the new chair of the Speaker's Committee. She's also our membership secretary. Thank you for all of that. Skip over the speaker for just a moment. Amy Morris is the organizer of today's luncheon. This is her first, and she's done a fabulous job. Thank you for all of that. And she is executive editor and anchor for Federal News Radio, part of the WTOP empire. Thurgood Marshall, Jr. is Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors for the Postal Service. I'm told he, I'm, he is the incoming chair as well. Congratulations. Nice to have you here today. And uh, the list of former presidents goes on and on. Jerry Zremski, a former NPC president. He's also the Bureau Chief of the Buffalo News. Sean Riley is a reporter for the Federal Times. And Mike Causey is Senior Correspondent for Federal News Radio. And now please give them your round of applause. Popular lore tells us of the U.S. Postal Service, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. But what weather might not prevent, a financial storm could. The fact is the United States Postal Service has been woven throughout the tapestry of American life. Since the birth of this country, it has been part of our community and our communication. But that tradition, that service, is very much at risk. The Postal Service is an organization in need of a new business model, it seems. As it stands, it cannot simply fold. It is under a legal mandate to serve all Americans, no matter where they live. The letter carrier who goes door to door in downtown Washington has the same responsibilities as the one who travels by boat to remote villages in Alaska. It is one of the few government agencies authorized by nothing less than the United States Constitution, Article I to be precise. The workers, businesses, and communities that rely upon the Postal Service, its deliveries, and frankly, its contracts, see it as a linchpin for their survival. It is part of a more than trillion dollar industry that employs upwards of eight million people. While it might be regarded as too big to fail, 
it continues to hemorrhage money, and failure appears to be a possibility, if not an option. The convenient blame is often placed on technology, email, text messaging, cheap phone service, making the classic handwritten letter seemingly obsolete. As mail volume declines, revenue continues to fall. In fiscal year 2011, the Postal Service lost more than $5 billion, as we now know. The more complicated aspect of fault perhaps lies with its own retiree health care plan. The Postal Service is legally mandated to pay $5.5 billion in prepayments toward retiree health benefits. It is a bill that has come due and the Postal Service cannot pay. The man who is tasked with fixing all of this is our guest today, the Postmaster General. Patrick Donahoe has been with the Postal Service for 35 years. He began his career there as a clerk. He was formally named Postmaster General less than one year ago, and he has his work cut out for him. In early September, he warned lawmakers the Postal Service was operating at that time with just one week's worth of cash. The weekly costs for the Postal Service add up to about a billion dollars. And now, Congress is involved. The 21st Century Postal Service Act of uh, 2011 has passed the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. It awaits action in the Senate, seemingly like a lot of things. This bill would preserve six-day mail delivery for the next two years, and it would also allow the Postal Service to renegotiate existing union contracts, offer buyouts to its employees, and recalibrate the pre-funding requirements for its retiree health benefits. So how can the Postal Service be saved? Will the legislation do the trick, or is it going to be a short-term fix that merely buys a little time? That's why we're here today. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm National Press Club welcome to the Postmaster General himself, Patrick Dunham. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. And it's a uh, pleasure to be here today and speak with all of you. I'd like to thank the National Press Club for the invitation for organizing today's event, too. I have the privilege of leading one of America's greatest institutions. It's an organization that serves literally 150 million American households and businesses on a typical day. It facilitates trillions of dollars of commerce. It supports a $900 billion mailing industry that employs 8 million people. The Postal Service is part of the bedrock infrastructure of the United States economy and of our society. And throughout our rich history, we've bound the nation together, and we do so today, even in this digital age. We connect every sender to every receiver and provide regular delivery to the most remote locations in this country. Americans today view the Postal Service very favorably as a familiar institution and a trusted, reliable part of American life. But for the institution to thrive, it requires a rational business model. The Postal Service is fundamentally a business. Yes, it's a government institution, but it operates as a business. We charge for delivery of products and services, we, our revenues go up and down depending on mailing trends in the economy. We record profit and losses. We issue quarterly financial statements. Matter of fact, we're even Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. And contrary to the understanding of most Americans, the Postal Service is not supported at all through taxpayer dollars. We generate all of our revenue from the sale of postage products and services. That means the Postal Service must compete for customers. We must sell, not just offer, but actively sell and persuade people to buy our products in a very competitive marketplace. And unfortunately, while we have the mandate to operate like a business, the reality is that we do not have the flexibility under current law to function like a business. America needs a Postal Service that can operate more like a business. Consider the example of a post office. Most retail companies would close retail stores that fail to turn a profit. Roughly 25,000 out of our 32,000 post offices operate at a loss. We've got thousands of post offices that bring in less than $20,000 $20, of revenue in a year that cost more than $60,000 to operate. 
and many of these are within a few miles of the next neighboring post office. And yet, a reaction from attempting to close one of these low activity post offices and provide another option is really something to behold. People rally around their local post office, and they do so because it's part of their town. It's a cherished institution. On one hand, that demonstrates the power of our brand and the extent to which our customers feel connected to the Postal Service. But on the other hand, it makes no business sense. There are better and more efficient ways that we can serve our customers. Here's an interesting statistic. Purchasing stamps accounts for 48% of all the retail transactions that happen in a typical post office. Now think about that for a couple seconds. People drive out of their way, go to the post office to buy stamps, and they don't have to do that. Today there are 71,000 locations operated by retail partners that provide a, a variety of postal products and services, such as buying stamps, dropping off packages, depending on the location. These retail partners are in grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, and they're places that are convenient. Part of your regular shopping pattern, they're, they're open longer hours, and most of them are open seven days a week. It provides a simpler, more convenient experience for our customers. In the coming years, we want to dramatically increase the number of retail partner locations that we offer. And we think there's a huge opportunity for small businesses to operate village post offices or some type of other postal uh, retail unit. And by the way, virtually everything that you can do at the post office, today you can also do on USPS.com. Now the question is, will there always be a role for a traditional full service post office? Absolutely. But there are other creative convenient options for providing access to our products and services. We just need the flexibility, just like any other business, to provide them. We're in a deep financial crisis today because we have a business model that is tied to the past. We're, we are expected to operate like a business but do not have the flexibility to do so. Our business model is fundamentally inflexible. It, provides postal it prevents the Postal Service from solving problems and being effective in the way a business would. Delivery companies facing a significant downturn in revenue would consider adjusting delivery frequency, just as our competitors did when they saw the economy slowing in 2008 and 2009. Now looking ahead and facing another 20% volume decline on top of the 23% we've had already, the Postal Service should be able to do the same, adjust delivery frequency. Most businesses make product and pricing decisions quickly based on market demand. We still have to go through a cumbersome process to price our products. Our competition can make these changes on a moment's notice. Most companies don't pre-fund retiree health benefits. Not only is the Postal Service required to pre-fund, we're required by law to fully fund an entire 40-year obligation in 10 years. The practical result is the Postal Service has had to borrow money from the Treasury, $5.5 billion a year, to give it back to the Treasury in annual $5.5 billion installments, and that's effectively bankrupted us. The Postal Service has also been, able, has been obliged to overpay into the Federal Employee Retirement System, not civil service, Federal Employee Retirement System, by $11.4 billion over the course of the last 20 years. And not only are we obliged to over we're not a.
Well, the good thing is, is they've definitely been paying attention to the situation. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> if we can only get that $11.4 billion back, we'd be able to keep a couple of post offices open. Um, but such mandated obligations have really been a, a, an enormous drag on our financial stability, and they're obligations which we've had absolutely no control over. Consider this during the worst downturn in mail volume in 2008 and 2009. The operations of the Postal Service, the operations were profitable. Our $6.6 .6 billion in losses were due to a $7 billion mandated retiree health benefit payment that no other business would have made. Given the volume declines we experienced, that uh, statistic says to me that we, are, we do a very good job at controlling costs, but we're working with insurmountable constraints. Over the past four years, we've reduced the size of the workforce by 128,000 employees and reduced annual operating costs by $12.5 billion. And we did so while maintaining record level service. And that's a testament to the tremendous job that our employees do on a daily basis. You know, looking ahead, we're accelerating the pace of cost uh, reductions. We've announced plans to reduce the total number of mail processing facilities from 460 today to less than 200 by the year 2013. We've announced plans to study uh, 3,500 low activity post offices for potential closure or consolidation. And we're streamlining our delivery operations with the goal of reducing another 20,000 delivery routes. But as significant as these cost reductions and revenue generation activities are, they do not come close to returning the Postal Service to profitability. To turn a profit and to get on a sustainable financial track, we have advanced a plan to achieve a $20 billion cost reduction by 2015. Unfortunately, as things currently stand, we do not have the, fl the flexibility in our business model to achieve this goal. And for this reason, we propose important changes to the laws that govern the Postal Service. We propose gaining delivery flexibility, which we'd use to transition to a five-day delivery schedule. Most other posts around the world have done this years ago, and there's been very little customer impact and a lot of benefit from a financial standpoint. We've proposed rebalancing our retirement funds, including the restoration of the $11.4 billion in overpayment into the Federal Employee Retirement System, the FERS account, and a more rational retiree health benefit payment schedule. We propose taking over our employee health insurance, and that would mean leaving the federal government and shifting to private providers. We'd also be able to reduce total costs for current and, ret and, and retired employees while providing better benefits. We propose streamlining our product and pricing process so that we can get to the market quicker. And we also are seeking the ability to manage our workforce more effectively and with greater flexibility. These and other proposals would enable the Postal Service to operate more as a business does, to provide better service and better compete for our customers. I'm grateful that Congress is now working on postal reform legislation, and the entire universe of stakeholders should be grateful as well. We've seen a strong commitment to our issues from Congress and, and the administration. However, there's a big question that needs to be answered about what that final package will look like, how it treats the Postal Service as a business, and give us the business model flexibility that we need. And there's a simple standard to apply, and that has to do with the concept of speed. The Postal Service is contending with a steady decline, 7% a year, in the use of first-class mail. This is due to the rise of electronic communications. People are paying bills online. This 7% annual decline puts us in a race to get ahead of the cost curve. To become profitable, we must be able to cut costs faster than the rate of decline with first-class mail. Speed is the answer, and speed is also the best way to judge whether Congress is truly interested in enabling the Postal Service to operate more like a business. Provisions that delay our ability to cut costs will result in sizable financial losses. For example, if we're unable to implement the five-day delivery schedule now, we will needlessly carry a $3 billion operating cost. Multiply that by several years, and you've got a pretty big number. If instead of consolidating 260 mail processing facilities in the next two years, legislation were to slow or delay that process, we might needlessly carry another $3 billion 
and operating expense. The same goes for provisions that would impact our ability to modernize our retail networks and to manage our workforce and our health care costs more effectively. If Congress does not pass the legislation that allows for more effective cost control and does not make fundamental changes to our business model, the Postal Service could soon be running deficits in the range of 10 to 15 billion dollars annually. You know that phrase, speed kills? Well, lack of speed will kill the Postal Service. That's a stark choice. A more flexible business model that allows us to control costs more quickly or very large losses that will ultimately burden the American taxpayer. Will first class mail volumes eventually level off? We'll see. But we know that volume will decline quickly for the rest of this decade and we simply don't have the ability to cut our costs quick enough. Those are the facts. However, with the right legislation that enables swift action, the Postal Service can quickly return to profitability and stay profitable and continue to self-fund universal service that we provide today. We need provisions in the final legislation that provide us with the speed to reduce our costs by $20 billion by 2015. Businesses don't decide operational issues for years on end and create impediments to resolving problems. They make decisions quickly and they act quickly. Unfortunately, the legislation currently drafted in both houses of Congress would not provide the Postal Service with the speed and flexibility that it needs. Both bills have elements that delay tough decisions and impose greater constraints on our business model. Taken as they are, they do not come close to enabling the cost reductions of $20 billion by 2015, which they must do for us in order to return back to profitability. If passed today, either bill would provide at best a couple of years of profitability and at least many decades of steep losses. However, taking the best of the House, the Senate, and the administration of approaches, Congress can provide the Postal Service with the legal framework and business model that it needs. It all comes back to the notion of speed. Will the Postal Service be able to get ahead of the cost curve or will we be doomed for perpetual losses? Congress needs to step back and look at the Postal Service as a business and give us the business model that allows us to act quickly to lower our costs. Today we operate in a very dynamic environment. People and businesses have many ways to communicate, and we responded within the constraints of our current business model. We compete for customers and are more market responsive and efficient than we've ever been. We deliver nearly half of the world's mail and do that with record level high service. We use the most advanced mail sorting technology in the world. In fact, about 95% of mail that comes through our system, letter sized mail, is never really touched by human hands until the letter carrier puts it in the mailbox. Our productivity has increased dramatically since 2000. In fact, we deliver roughly the same amount of volume we delivered in 1992 with about 170,000 fewer employees. The result of cultivating the mindset of a postal service that records profits and losses, operates efficiently like a business, and competes for customers. We've got to go much further down that path. If we do so, I'm convinced that the postal service can have a very bright future. We can continue to provide the nation with secure, reliable, affordable delivery platform. We can be profitable and be self-sustaining. We can continue to innovate and change to meet the mailing and shipping needs of the American public for generations to come. We can also be thought of differently as a successful business enterprise that performs a vital national function. It will only happen if Congress develops a, a single simple, straightforward piece of legislation that provides key areas of flexibility. The ability to determine our own delivery frequency. The ability to develop and price products quickly. The ability to control our health care and retirement costs. The ability to quickly realign our mail processing, delivery, and retail networks. To streamline governance and to provide more flexibility in the way that we leverage our workforce. All of this needs to be done right now. The Postal Service is far too integral to the, American, to the health of the economic health of this nation to be handcuffed to the past and to an inflexible business model. America needs a Postal Service that can evolve and operate with fewer constraints. I have no doubt that the Postal Service will remain a great American institution. But in order to do so, we need a great business model. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for your poise and your speech. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. So talking about Congress, obviously in the news today for other reasons, uh, and this, the so-called super committee, uh, and you're talking about Congress needing to get the job done for you. Uh, let's break this down in two steps. First of all, where is uh, that legislation that you're talking about in terms of moving forward? And what, how do you look at those prospects at this point? And then the other piece would be, uh, what does the apparent breakdown of the super committee's uh, work, or the inability to come up with the $1.2 trillion, uh, how does that affect your operations? So two pieces okay. there. First off, um, I, th I think it's important uh, to, to keep in mind that when we talk about legislation, we are pushing for legislation that will help the United States of America, that helps the mailing industry, and make sure that the Postal Service is strong and vibrant for the future. So that's the focus, the entire industry and uh, the, the people that we serve in this country. From a standpoint of where the bills are, there's a couple things that are going on. Number one, the administration has weighed in with a letter that they sent to the, to the uh, Deficit Commission. I'll talk about that in a second. But what, what they've said is uh, they, they agree that we should move on the six to five day. Uh, they also make some changes in product offering. They agree to give us our overpayment and defers back and a couple other small things. So you've got that on the table. There are two bills, one in, in the House, one in Senate. Both of them have gone through a markup process. Uh, again, there's very good points in each one of them. In the House, they're talking about quickly allowing us the delivery flexibility. Uh, there's some other opportunities in there for us to control some costs uh, and also some flexibility from a pricing perspective going forward. In the Senate, uh, we've got some good opportunities there from a standpoint of, of new product development. They have the, the, the ability to move to six, from six to five, they have some other changes, but the problem is uh, there's a little bit of a delay in time on that. So, what we'd like to be able to do over the course of the next couple months is try to get everybody on the same page, work through the legislative process, and come up with, what, again, what we outlined here uh, today as we've talked about this. From a super committee standpoint, we don't know what's going to happen. We've heard that we're in the bill. There's nobody that's come forth and said we're definitely in there. Uh, we'll have to see tonight what, what the outcome uh, is, with, uh, just like the rest of the American public. So in terms of the prospects for passage of that legislation in the House and Senate, how, how confident are you? Um, you know, there's a lot of people that would say uh, it's going to be a tough year. You know, if you don't get it done this year, nothing's going to happen with elections next year. But I will say this, though, I think the administration and the Congress, both the House and the Senate, understand the vital importance of a healthy postal service. You know, we've spent a lot of time, and these guys have done a lot of good work. If you see the work that's been done already from the administration and with, with uh, Senator Collins, Senator Lieberman, Senator Carper, Senator Brown, they've made a lot, they've gotten a lot of things done uh, over in the House side with, with Congressman Issa, Ross, Cummings, and, and Lynch. They've gotten a lot. So there's a lot of interest. It's just a matter of trying to get what's out there right now uh, thought through and pushed so that we get, A, something done quickly, and we're able to act quickly going forward. Uh, one of our questioners uh, sends up a question, says, what is the intent of the ISA Ross bill if, as you say, it wouldn't actually save the Postal Service? Well, you know, again, from, from I, think, I think it's, in, from their perspective, it's the best way to approach the issue. You know, there's a couple things there. They, they, they do allow us to quickly move uh, into a six-day, uh, from a six-day to a five-day environment. Uh, they are saying give us the overpayment back from the first uh, system. There, however, there are some additional um, constraints that I see, it, and that's around the network changes. We'd have a little bit more government oversight with network changes, post offices. I think we can do these things much quicker if we just act on them now. Within the bill, the, uh, the ISA bill also has a control board, uh, which would almost step in like Washington, D.C., and, and take over the role of the Postal Service and our governors. If we get to that point, we failed. Uh, what we're saying is give us, the, give us the freedom to act like a business now, and we will make sure that we, pr we get a much stronger Postal Service going forward right now. We don't really need uh, another body to be telling us what to do. Uh, last night you announced the Postal Service was extending contract negotiations with your two unions. The questioner asks, are you on your way to arbitration and a deal that, quote, favors unions? Well, here's the thing. As I mentioned earlier, our employees do a tremendous job. They, they provide great service. When you see the reductions that, that we've done from a cost standpoint and, and the, the productivity improvements that our people have, have shown, they do a great job. We have an excellent working relationship with our unions. We have four unions, three management associations. They understand 
the issues that are facing the Postal Service. So when we got to the point last night where, where we needed an extension, I think it's well worth sitting down to continue to talk. I mean, there may be a solution in there. We, from a Postal Service standpoint, we're looking to resolve this health care issue and at the same time, more flexibility with our labor. Okay. What happens if you don't reach an agreement? Well, then we go to arbitration, but let's, let's you know, I'm a, I'm a ha glass is much more than half full person, so I'm hoping we can get something worked out. Questioner says the November 18th deadline for you to make a $5.5 billion retiree health payment has come and gone, of course. Uh, did you default, and if so, what's the consequence? We didn't default, and the, what, what's happened is in the continuing resolution, the Postal Service has been exempted from making that payment now, I think, until the 18th of December. Uh, our proposals on health care would basically eliminate the need to prefund. We've, we've, we've laid out a game plan. Take it, take it, taking the plans over ourselves, working with the unions as a potential provider in there as we work through that, we can eliminate substantial requirements now that exist on this organization to require this prepayment. This prepayment is a sword of Damocles above the head of this entire industry and needs to get resolved. So does that change uh, infer that there would be a diminution in benefits to those people that it covers? No, I don't think so. I, there are people in this room who I've spoken to, two big companies, who have recently renegotiated their own health care plans with big providers. It's not like we'd be out getting health care from somebody on the street corner. You know, you, there are big providers, and these guys have told me, hey, one had reduced health care costs by 14%, the other by 12. This year, the Postal Service will pay $7.2 billion in health care without the prefunding, without the prefunding. So if we're able to get a strike a deal with a health care providers to take 10% cost reduction, that's $720 million forever. That gives you big opportunities to cut costs going forward. And the same thing, you know, part of the other potential or push we've had with the health care has been, has been working with our retirees to move them on to Medicare. The way it's set up now, we are paying, we're overpaying for retiree health benefits for our retirees since they're not required to go on Medicare. We think that we can get a better deal for them better cost coverage, and better health care with the proposals we're going for. Here's a question that came over the electronic transom, uh, said to have come from a postal employee who works near Lansing, Michigan. Says, and this, this is the person's question, how do you plan to ratify two contracts currently in negotiations when in this person's view you haven't honored the APWU contract you just signed? Well, we've done a lot of work with the APWU uh, from a standpoint of implementing the changes. I think we have honored it. We continue to work to honor any of the contracts that we sign with our employees. Um, you know, we want to, we have to work to get more flexibility. We achieved that to a large extent with the APW. That's what we're implementing now. Okay. The uh, person asks, are you making any changes in your position on post office closing? Senator Collins said you endorsed the language that would create a new post office standard. Here's what we're looking at. There's. The one thing that we don't want to do is, is close up a post office and walk away. Many of these towns, and it depends on where you're at in, in the United States, is farther out west you get, it, 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 they're a lot farther apart. You know, what we're looking at is between a consolidation to a nearby post office, providing additional rural service. Our rural carriers today can actually, they're a post office on wheels, and we can provide that service, matching up the hours with the, 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 the actual workload. In many cases, we're open for eight hours, and we have less than two hours of work, less than one hour of work in some cases. A, a number of those as Sounds well Sounds like as, a good job to have. I know. <laughs> well, no, it would be boring. <laughs> Think of how boring it would be. No, but seriously. Speaker, please. You're too far from the oh, I'm sorry. Um, at any rate, the, the, those are the, we have those opportunities, plus we're looking at things like the village post office where you can team up with a local store and provide service. That way it keeps the store open, gives us the ability to provide that service. Questioner asks, do you still have only one week's worth of operating cash? Well, I have to ask the CFO, he's here. Um, here's where we are on the cash. We, we have, right now, uh, we had a ruling that, that came out that, that says that we're going to have to pay back the FERS money that we set aside. We're doing that. Uh, we still will have a couple weeks of operating cash. That's why it's so important to get this bill resolved because, like any other business, we'd like to get the operating cash and pay the debt down so we're much stronger going out in the future. Another question came in via email. Has the Postal Service studied any international postal models? The person says, I know Canada and New Zealand have intriguing postal systems. Does the Postal Service feel it can use another country's model to fix its current 
situation? I spoke, as a matter of fact, I was in, in Canada on Friday and spoke with a couple people from uh, different posts around the world. There are different models, but a lot of it comes back to a, a public expectation and NB what you do. We are the we are we have almost 50 percent of the world's mail because we have a very different postal service. You know, you've got mail bills come through the mail, payments come through the mail, magazines, catalogs. Many of these other posts are, are a much lighter volume post. They also charge a heck of a lot more. Now, Germany charges 75 cents a letter. How about if we just move the price up to 75 cents and everybody would be happy. I don't think so. But, you know, so, so those are some of the suggestions that we get in. Um, we think that, we think from a, from a business model perspective, looking forward, first class mail is going to drop off. We know that. We're preparing. That's why we need to make some changes. But we think from an advertising standpoint, we think from a package delivery standpoint, and we think that there's definitely an opportunity for us in the digital world, and we want to go in that direction. So along those lines, somebody asks, uh, besides the five-day uh, week delivery schedule, what other best practices can you adopt? I mean, sort of a variation on the same question. Well, you know, we, we adopt things based on, on what we see that, that are uh, that are industry bests. You know, we we are we are very much tied into both FedEx and UPS from a standpoint of delivering their packages, and you know, uh, they we use them for transportation purposes too. And we've learned a lot from them as far as visibility and customer expectations that way. We've learned a lot from retailers around how to best serve customers, looking at uh, different options on self service and some of those. So so from a from a standpoint of best practices, we're open to anyone, any business in the U.S. to look and see how best to do it, and the same thing with the foreign posts. What, what do you do with respect to measuring customer satisfaction, and where are you with that? Um, we have a saying, what gets measured gets done. We are measuring, we measure everything. We measure point-to-point -point service, whether it's uh, blue mail, box mail. We measure right now all the commercial mail that comes through. We probably, on a, on a monthly basis, have a delivery score for about 8 billion pieces of mail. So we measure that against uh, time and service. We also run mystery shopper programs, and we've got uh, customer experience measurement. And we're constantly looking at what the customer's saying in order to try to improve our performance. So how, how are you doing, generally well, speaking? Our overnight mail service right now is about 96.5% on time, two and three days in the, is in the mid-90s. Uh, from a customer satisfaction standpoint, uh, we, we get some, we, we only measure, I'm very satisfied or mostly satisfied. We don't even like to deal with satisfied, and we're up on the high 80s on those scores. The goal there is to get up to 100%. How about the treatment at the counter? Uh, all of us have had different experiences with that over time. Some people are better than others. Uh, how, how do you work on that kind of a situation? That's, you have to work on that every day because as you make changes, what happens is with the with the, uh, the work hour changes, work hour reductions you make, you constantly have to work with the employees to talk about how important it is for that good customer service. Do we have some spots where we have to do more more work? Absolutely, and we have a lot of great people out there that provide great service every day. Someone asks, how many post offices have you closed, or any? Uh, under the latest closing initiative, and how many processing plants, and uh, is there a delay in that process of closing? In the last year, we've closed about 500 post offices. That was in the first run through. This 3,700 we're looking at right now are still in the evaluation process. We've closed about uh, 50 processing facilities over the course of the last year and a half, and we'll continue to do that. I mean, it's as the volume has dropped, we have to make these changes. You just can't wait until the bitter end and then try to close. We've got to take the cost out now. And is there an appeals process where a community says, hey, we're special? Yes. <laughs> yes. How does that work? Well, here's what happens. We, if you close a post office, you have to have a public meeting. And you explain why you want to do that. One of the things we've been, we've been learning as we've been going through this is it's better to go in and give people some options. I, I think that that's, that's an area where we haven't done as well going in. It's, it's not been there. We haven't articulated the options. So uh, we're, we'll go in. A person, a town has the opportunity to send it, uh, come back to us with, a, with a, an objection or to the regulatory commission. Uh, they're doing that. We're trying to work through those things now. Uh, the same with the, with the processing facility. We have what's called an area mail processing process where it's the same kind of public hearing, and we go through those pro that process too. And, and, you know, the key thing for us is we shrink this network down. The most important thing for people to know from a customer's perspective is we, we do not want to make it any any more difficult at, 
to, to get mail into our system. We want to make it easy. So we'll retain locations where we're closing a facility so that people don't have to go out of their way. In fact, for a lot of the small businesses, we want to have the mail come through the front door rather than the back door, which will even make it easier for people. So as we make these changes, we'll use technology to make it a, a, a much better, friendlier process for the customers. So can the political process get involved here when you're asking Congress obviously to uh, give you legislation to make your operations uh, fiscally sustainable. Uh, how, what kind of involvement politically do members of Congress have on this decision-making process as it relates to closing post offices? Well, you know, you get opinions from many different people. Some people, and it's interesting, I mean, there's 535 members of Congress, and I think if you gave them a list of 10 issues with us, you would have 535 different uh, scores at the end of that. Uh, there's, there are some Congress uh, members of Congress that don't close the post office for any reason. There are some that are pushed to close. There are some that want us to move from six to five, others that are worried. A lot of it is our responsibility to educate and, and put all the options in front of people. You know, the, the, the more we can communicate and make sure that people understand, A, where we're trying to get to, and B, how we're going to get there, I think that we'll be able to move both the public and Congress in that direction. Six to five day, hey, you know, 80% of Americans now are saying move from six to five day. Don't, don't, do not become a burden on the American taxpayers. We do not want to become a burden on the American taxpayers. Back to the union question. Uh, the questioner says there's a lot of animosity between management and unions. Do you have any hopes or plans to try to change that? Well, I think that, I don't think that there is that much animosity between management and union. You're going to have that down through an organization at any point in time. You can find that in the auto industry, the steel industry, anywhere else you've got a unionized workforce. I think that our four union leaders are very responsible people. The three people that are the heads of our management associations, very responsible people. You know, they have their opinions on things. I like to be able to listen. I also uh, res respect those opinions, and I also know that they've listened to a lot of our suggestions. I think bottom line, bottom line, both with the unions and the other stakeholders in this industry is we've got to coalesce, we have to, to give some things up in some cases, but any time that you're going to come up with a, with a, with a good win-win-win situation, everybody's got to be able to give a little bit. So a knowledgeable person in our audience says 80% of Americans may want six to five day delivery, but Senator Collins isn't among them. How are you going to work around that? <laughs> well, it's like anything else. You know, you constantly work at it. You know, and we've talked to Senator Collins on this, and her biggest concern is what about rural America? What about people not being able to get medicines on a weekend? That's her issue. And we've talked through, is there some potential other changes in there? Do you, do you go with um, you know, uh, the five non-widely observed holidays and have a Saturday delivery there? That's been a proposal. Uh, bottom line is, is there's two things that are happening. We've lost 24% of the mail. We're losing another 20%. And the shift from first class, which pays the bills, is relentless, and we've got to get our finances in good order. So we'll keep working with Senator Collins and everyone else to try to work through these issues. Speaking of uh, giving uh, politically correct answers, uh, here's one that says, uh, assess your regulator. Do they do a good job of helping the Postal Service remain financially solvent? I think we have an excellent relationship with our regulator. I do, and, and, and Ruth is here, and I think she would, she, would, she would tell us that. I mean, we try to reach out and communicate. We have spent a lot of time over the last few years, whether it's price and product and, and um, service uh, changes, service standards, we've worked with these guys. To a large extent, the issues that we're looking for are, are legislative issues. It's not the, the regulator does what they're supposed to do. So if you give them a list of 10 things that they have to do, they have to do 10 things. If the list is only three things, then they only do three things. You know, I think we've got a good working relationship. I think the other thing, the regulator definitely has an interest in the American public and the mailers, and you have to have that balance any time that you're dealing with a large organization like the Post Service. Uh, speaking of members of Congress, someone asked, is it time to start charging members of Congress something to use the Postal Service? We do charge them. They pay. They, they do? Yeah. I mean, there, the one thing about the Postal Service, and people have said that to us, you can't say that you, um, they'll say to us, you, you can't uh, say that, that you don't take any, t that you take no taxpayer money. We don't. Even things like matter for the blind, foreign or uh, offshore voting, that's just rec recouping postage uh, because of laws that were passed. No, the Congress, they, they have to pay for franking privileges. 
Okay. Uh, so the questioner says, how do you get past each member of Congress not accepting post office closings in his or her congressional district? And uh, do, they, do any of them see the so-called big picture when it comes to jobs and uh, services in their home districts? I think that, I think that Congress and Congress dealing with the Postal Service is not a whole lot different than dealing with the rest of the issues that we face in this federal government. We are a, we are a microcosm of what's happening now. There's a $7 income and a $10 spend, and you have to figure out what's the best way, the fairest way, the least effect on customers to shrink that down. As we sit down with people and you walk through the options and you explain things, they understand. There's very few people that I've run into over there who have been adamant and wouldn't listen on any point. Uh, if, if you share the ideas, and we listen, going in trying to understand both points of view, I think that you know that's the approach that we're going to have to take in order to get this resolved. I think one of our former presidents here at the table is saying, what would Ben Franklin, our nation's first postmaster general, do to improve postal service operations? I'm not sure. <laughs> we, uh, no, it's, 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 it's a, uh, I, I think the, the thing that's important about the Postal Service is, is you've got to keep the basic tenets of customer service and universal service in the forefront. You know, we have these issues that we've got to figure out from a financial standpoint, and we'll do that without hurting our customers, and I think that's what Ben Franklin would tell us. <laughs> Someone asked, if thousands of post offices do close, what happens to the real estate? Well, we, we are selling real estate and eliminating leases as we speak. Last year, I think we probably sold about 250 to 300 million dollars worth of buildings will continue that. Um, we, you know, it's an interesting statistic with the post office. We have 70 percent of our floor space is owned, yet we, yet we only own about um, 30 percent of our buildings. So we own the big ones, we lease the small ones, and as you close some of these places up, you get rid of the leases. Now, that's where some of the pushback comes from. There's somebody out there that has a lease for a post office. They've been, that's considered better than a municipal bond, right? And I'll, don't get rid of that. And so th then what happens to the employees once that uh, facility closes? Uh, we're, we're working through that. Um, here's the, you know, from an employee standpoint, we've reduced the career headcount and non-career headcount in this organization by over 250,000 people since the year 2000. We've never laid anybody off. There's been a couple of people that have chosen to leave based on moving somewhere, but you know we're proud of that. I mean, I come from Pittsburgh, Steel Town. I watched thousands, you know, 50,000 people get laid off in one fell swoop. When you come to work at the Postal Service, people do a good job. You read our motto in the beginning, even though it's unofficial. People feel that way, and trying to work through this process with the unions, with local people, put options out there. Uh, that's what we want to try to do as we downsize. The one thing we have in our, in our advantage is there's 155,000 people right now who are eligible to retire. So if they retire, then they're not unemployed. So we're trying to work through all those two. And uh, someone asked, uh, have you had trouble selling any of these facilities in what is not a great real estate? Um, we've, we've had a couple that uh, have been on the market. It's interesting. Uh, you know, our feeling in a couple, maybe two years ago, was, well, maybe we should hold on. But the look ahead with real estate is not getting any better. I mean, you're hearing this this talk about the bubble, or you know, and the pricing issue still being there for the next 10 years. So our feeling is, sell them, put the money in the bank, cut the operating costs. What? How much impact are your current uh, campaigns for priority mail and smaller pieces having on reversing or slowing your declining revenues? Um, priority has been great. If it fits, it ships. Uh, great. I mean, you. We have a great ad coming out. It'll be probably out next week for uh, for the holidays with Al, the letter carrier. We've increased priority mail by about 78 percent. That that flat rate box has transitioned over the last three or four years. So that's been good. The other thing we've done is that we've, we're advertising. We're advertising right now for first class mail. It's the first time we've done it in years. And the whole message there is first class mail is important. And we think that. Uh, you know, customers need to think about it that way. We'll also have some advertisements coming up for standard mail, and we think it'll go a long way too. For today's small business owners, what are some of the most cost-effective ways to use postal services, products, and services? Um, every door direct. Um, if you are a realtor, I was trying to sell people on every door direct from the table up here. Um, it's a very simple way to reach your customers. You can go online. You can actually get into the mail without a lot of the uh, charges that we have when you get a little more sophisticated. Once you get in and find it works, we have a tremendous 
resource of people out there in the, in the mailing industry, whether they're address firms or whether they're mailers, printers, they do a great job too. It is the most direct way and, the most, and it's the best, best return on investment in any way that you can reach your customer. One of the Postal Service unions has hired Ron Bloom to help create a pro-growth business plan. Uh, that was a union hire, but have they talked to you about strategies or his role? We've talked to Ron Bloom and the Lazard people. I think it's a good move on the part of the NALC. Uh, Ron Bloom, I think any organization that he's been uh, uh, involved with, uh, the focus is on how do you continue to make sure the organization thrives. That way you can provide excellent employment for the union members. So you talked about Germany and the 75 cent stamp essentially there. Uh, how, do you f how do you know what the right price point is, uh, particularly if obviously you're trying to staunch the flow of red ink? Right. Uh, why not have a substantial postal rate increase? Well, uh, that's, been an, that's been an issue for us. It's, it, you know, w what we are very, very careful of doing is pricing ourselves out of business. You know, if you, if you take a look, uh, whether it's catalogs or whether it's advertising mail or first class mail or periodicals, each of those provides, um, there, there are a way to communicate with the segment of the American public. Our big fear is, is if you if you put too much of a price change on standard mail, you'll chase people to the internet, even though they won't get the same kind of a return. So we're being very careful, just like any other business would. Questioner says uh, you've said that you'd stop delivering the mail by next fall if Congress does not pass a bill to help you. If Congress does pass a bill that gives you everything you want, how quickly do you see pulling out of the red? Well, I think that if Congress gave us everything that we needed right now, we would be out of the red by the end of 2013. So we'd have a positive 2014, a positive 2015, and getting that money back on the FERS overpayment would go right against debt, which would substantially shrink our debt. So we'd be in excellent shape from a debt uh, to revenue perspective, and uh, we would be running a, a, with profits. Someone note, makes note of the fact that uh, uh, that you have prepared to distribute antibiotics in case of a, another bio, bioterrorism attack. If, God forbid, an attack did come, uh, how ready do you feel you are? We have worked with the uh, Department of Human and Health Services and uh, have run drills, as a matter of fact, in three or four major cities where we actually have our letter carriers who have volunteered and come in and actually go to people's doors and deliver antibiotics or whatever they would need. So we've worked carefully with the uh, unions, carrier union, rural carrier union. Um, based on what we've done, we'd be ready if called upon. So you have, by, I think your website says you have some 216,000 vehicles that you use. Uh, what have you learned about alternative energy to fuel them? Well, we, we run a number of small fleets with alternative energy. Electric, we have a number of electric vehicles across the country. We've had the largest natural gas fleet going. It's, we've, we've, we've thinned that out a little bit. We've run uh, the, the hydro uh, or the, the, the um, hydrogen vehicles out on the West Coast and, and, and experimented even with uh, the uh, um, hybrids. The key thing for us is this. You've got to make very good decisions with vehicles. People pitch that all the time. Well, buy, buy a new fleet. If we replace our fleet, it will cost seven billion dollars. So you and you keep we keep our fleet for 25 years. So if you if you got a seven billion dollar investment and you're stuck with it for 25 years, you better make a good decision. If we had to make a decision today, as I'm standing here, I'd go with a four-cylinder gasoline engine because it is still by far the cheapest to operate and the cheapest from a long-term standpoint. Is the fleet itself being uh, reduced in size because yep. of the other changes? Yep, we have reduced. Oh, probably, I think we're down under, I know we're under 216 now, we're probably down to about 211 or 212. What we've been doing is we've been taking vehicles out of the fleet and also replacing, we've been providing vehicles to our rural carriers because A, it's a better vehicle to deliver out of, plus it's safer, and we've been working through that. So we, we've probably net-net reduced somewhere in the vicinity of uh, 12 to 14,000 vehicles in the last few years. Questioner says the mail recovery center in Atlanta sells a mere 200 lots of undeliverable mail each month at a profit, but one must be in Atlanta to bid and buy. Are you considering internet-based auction methods like GSA? You know, what, the, the, um, and I'm not so sure we should be doing that probably on eBay or something like that. That's, I don't know. I, I, I'm not familiar, but no, we, we can look into that. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> member of our audience says, who will be the first living person on a U.S. stamp? <laughs> Perhaps Lady Gaga? Oh, oh. Lady Here's, Gaga fan. Let me say this. 
you'll have to wait until the Citizen Stamp Advisory Co Committee figures that one out. And what's the timeline on all that? Probably next year, early next year. There's a lot of discussion going on. They have some excellent ideas. And, uh, Can you and share a few? No, I can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's a good reporter. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're just about out of time, but before we ask the very last question, we have a couple of our, uh, dare I say, routine housekeeping matters to take care of. I'd like to remind our audience about one upcoming luncheon speaker, uh, Jim Cantori, the on-camera meteorologist with the Weather Channel, will be here on uh, December 14th. So. Uh, that will be the next opportunity to see uh, a journalist here in the National Press Club at the podium, uh, aside from myself, perhaps. Uh, but uh, the other thing that we do for each and every speaker, including other postmasters general over time, is to present you with our traditional National Press Club Thank coffee you. mug. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. So here's our last question. Uh, the holidays are rapidly approaching, busy time for shippers all over, including the Postal Service. When you have to mail something, do you have to stand in line? I go to the South Park PA Post Office, 15129, and I, have to, I, I do that so that I see just how our customers have to mail mail. Buy all my stamps there, and it works out great. They do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. All how right. about a round of applause for our speaker today? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you to all of you for coming today, and I'd like to thank our National Press Club staff, including the National Press Club Journalism Institute and our Broadcast Center, for helping to organize today's event, and that includes our Executive Director, Victor Bill McCarran, and the Assistant to the President, Havila Ross. Without her, I'd be dead. Uh, finally, here's a reminder that you can find out more information about the National Press Club on our website, and if you want to get a copy of today's program, you can check that out at www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick, a broadcast and online journalist with the Associated Press, and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. It's good to have you here today. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while working to foster a free press worldwide. For more information about the club, you can visit our website at www.press.org and to donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, you can check the website there as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, as well as those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of the speaker, as well as working journalists who are all club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, and this is something I'm reminding people throughout this political season, as well as for today's event, if you hear applause in the audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. <laughs> Laughter is encouraged. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available for free download on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag PoundNPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have Q&A and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Well, now it is time to introduce our head table guests, and please note, again in this political season, the journalist's presence at the head table does not imply or signify an endorsement of the speaker. I'd ask each of you to stand up briefly as your name is announced. We begin from your right, Matt Small. He's a veteran radio producer at my shop, the Associated Press. He's so competent, we call him the Beast. Also joining us today, Ralph Winnie Jr., a club member, vice president of the Global Business Development for the Eurasian uh, Business Coalition. Good to have you here today, Ralph. Drew Von Bergen, he is among several former NPC presidents gracing our head table today. And it just so happens he is the retired public relations director with the National Association of Letter Carriers. So that's how he got heat for customers. We must sell, not just offer, but actively sell and persuade people to buy our products in a very competitive marketplace. And unfortunately, while we have the mandate to operate like a business, the reality is that we do not have the flexibility 
under current law to function like a business. America needs a postal service that can operate more like a business. Consider the example of a post office. Most retail companies would close retail stores that fail to turn a profit. Roughly 25,000 out of our 32,000 post offices operate at a loss. We've got thousands of post offices that bring in less than $20,000 of revenue in a year that cost more than $60,000 to operate. And many of these are within a few miles of the next neighboring post office. And yet a reaction from attempting to close one of these low activity post offices and provide another option is really something to behold. People rally around their local post office and they do so because it's part of their town. It's a cherished institution. On one hand, that demonstrates the power of our brand and the extent to which our customers feel connected to the Postal Service. But on the other hand, it makes no business sense. There are better and more efficient ways that we can serve our customers. Here's an interesting statistic. Purchasing stamps accounts for 48% of all the retail transactions that happen in a typical post office. Now think about that for a couple seconds. People drive out of their way, go to the post office to buy stamps, and they don't have to do that. Today there are 71,000 locations operated by retail partners that provide a, a variety of postal products and services, such as buying stamps, dropping off packages, depending on the location. These retail partners are in grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, and they're places that are convenient. Part of your regular shopping pattern, they're, they're open longer hours, and most of them are open seven days a week. It provides a simpler, more convenient experience for our customers. In the coming years, we want to dramatically increase the number of retail partner Same responsibilities as the one who travels by boat to remote villages in Alaska. It is one of the few government agencies authorized by nothing less than the United States Constitution, Article I to be precise. The workers, businesses, and communities that rely upon the Postal Service, its deliveries, and frankly, its contracts, see it as a linchpin for their survival. It is part of a more than trillion dollar industry that employs upwards of eight million people. While it might be regarded as too big to fail, it continues to hemorrhage money, and failure appears to be a possibility if not an option. The convenient blame is often placed on technology, email, text messaging, cheap phone service, making the classic handwritten letter seemingly obsolete. As mail volume declines, revenue continues to fall. In fiscal year 2011, the Postal Service lost more than $5 billion, as we now know. The more complicated aspect of fault perhaps lies with its own retiree health care plan. The Postal Service is legally mandated to pay $5.5 billion in prepayments toward retiree health benefits. It is a bill that has come due and the Postal Service cannot pay. The man who is tasked with fixing all of this is our guest today, the Postmaster General. Patrick Donahoe has been with the Postal Service for 35 years. He began his career there as a clerk. He was formally named Postmaster General less than one year ago, and he has his work cut out for him. In early September, he warned lawmakers the Postal Service was operating at that time with just one week's worth of cash. The weekly costs for the Postal Service add up to about a billion dollars. And now, Congress is involved. The 21st Century Postal Service Act of uh, 2011 has passed the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. It awaits action in the Senate, seemingly like a lot of things. This bill would preserve six-day mail delivery for the next two years, and it would also allow the Postal Service to renegotiate existing union contracts, offer buyouts to its employees, and recalibrate the pre-funding requirements for its retiree health benefits. So how can the Postal Service be saved? Will the legislation do the trick, or is it going to be a short-term fix that merely buys a little time? That's why we're here today. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm National Press Club welcome to the Postmaster General himself, Patrick Donahoe. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. And it's a uh, pleasure to be here today and speak with all of you. I'd like to thank the National Press Club for the invitation for organizing today's event, too. I have the privilege of leading one of America's greatest institutions. It's an organization that serves literally 
150 million American households and businesses on a typical day. It facilitates trillions of dollars of commerce. It supports a $900 billion mailing industry that employs 8 million people. The Postal Service is part of the bedrock infrastructure of the United States economy and of our society. And throughout our rich history, we've bound the nation together, and we do so today, even in this digital age. We connect every sender to every receiver and provide regular delivery to the most remote locations in this country. Americans today view the Postal Service very favorably as a familiar institution and a trusted, reliable part of American life. But for the institution to thrive, it requires a rational business model. The Postal Service is fundamentally a business. Yes, it's a government institution, but it operates as a business. We charge for delivery of products and services. We, our revenues go up and down depending on mailing trends in the economy. We record profit and losses. We issue quarterly financial statements. Matter of fact, we're even Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. And contrary to the understanding of most Americans, the Postal Service is not supported at all through taxpayer dollars. We generate all of our revenue from the sale of postage products and services. That means the Postal Service must compete. Got his ticket. Also joining us today is John Cosgrove. He is our senior surviving NPC president, organizer of the first Postal Forum. And for those of you who aren't club members and don't know John's story, he was inaugurated 51 years ago this next January. So John was inaugurated when JFK came over and offered him congratulations that day. I'm very happy that John could join us today as well. Uh, Ron Stroman is the Deputy Postmaster General. Thank you for being here, Ron. Skip over the podium for just a moment. Angela Greiling Keene is a reporter for Bloomberg News, and she is the new chair of the Speaker's Committee. She's also our membership secretary. Thank you for all of that. Skip over the speaker for just a moment. Amy Morris is the organizer of today's luncheon. This is her first, and she's done a fabulous job. Thank you for all of that. And she is executive editor and anchor for Federal News Radio, part of the WTOP empire. Thurgood Marshall, Jr. is Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors for the Postal Service. I'm told he, um, he is the incoming chair as well. Congratulations. Nice to have you here today. And uh, the list of former presidents goes on and on. Jerry Zremski, a former NPC president. He's also the Bureau Chief of the Buffalo News. Sean Riley is a reporter for the Federal Times. And Mike Causey is Senior Correspondent for Federal News Radio. And now please give them your round of applause. Popular lore tells us of the U.S. Postal Service, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. But what weather might not prevent, a financial storm could. The fact is the United States Postal Service has been woven throughout the tapestry of American life. Since the birth of this country, it has been part of our community and our communication. But that tradition, that service, is very much at risk. The Postal Service is an organization in need of a new business model, it seems. As it stands, it cannot simply fold. It is under a legal mandate to serve all Americans, no matter where they live. The letter carrier who goes door to door in downtown Washington has the same